plenary session. Our speaker will be Dan McShay, professor of evolutionary biology and member of the Center for Philosophy of Biology at Duke University, North Carolina. So he, he has a double uh, specialization, so to speak. Uh, he's a paleobiologist and also a philosopher of biology and indeed at least I am a philosopher of biology, so I, I'm, I know his work about uh, with, Brand, with Robert Brandon about the zero false force law of evolution. It was very debated and discussed in the field, and it is about uh, the origin of, of diversity and of complexity. Uh, if it, uh, how does it have to be explained? Um, and his talk today is entitled. Um, the evolution of insideness and the architecture of purpose. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really a philosopher wannabe, not an actual philosopher, yet working there, working to get there. Obrigado por me convidar. And according to Google Translator, that means thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Unfortunately, I don't trust Google Translator. I probably just said, your hovercraft is full of eels, right? <laughs> when my kids were little, I would ask them questions like, how much does the color green weigh? And they would look at me puzzled and confused, and we would have a conversation. At the end of the conversation, we would come to an answer on the order of, oh, I don't know, 10 to 12 pounds five kilos, give or take a little, maybe a little more on Thursdays. Color blue probably weighs more. My point with this silly little story is that not every question that you can pose and not every question that you can answer um, is really a question at all. And the last third of my talk feel perfectly entitled, you should feel perfectly entitled to think to yourself, the underlying question doesn't make sense. I'm not sure it does. I hope it does, but I'm not sure it does. So here is, here is, here is the same slide. <laughs> Let's change like this by now. Okay. Please, please go on. Oh, okay. Um, here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to start off talking about hierarchy. Um, about a trend in hierarchy, the trend in hierarchy over the history of life and some puzzles associated with that trend. Um, then I'm going to do what will appear to be a change of gears, um, talking about a drain in complexity as hierarchy arises, the loss of parts at lower levels. And then in a massive change of gears, I'm going to start talking about teleology, purpose, goal directedness, the structure of teleological systems. I hope it will all hang together. I hope it will all make sense together uh, by the end. All right, so I'm going to... Ah, got it, okay. So when I say hierarchy, I mean roughly what everybody else um, at this conference seems to mean. I mean nestedness. I mean containment. I mean little things inside of big things. I mean withinness. I mean insideness. You should think Russian dolls and Chinese boxes gas molecules in a balloon, cells within a multicellular organism, buffalo within a herd, students within a university. When I say hierarchy, it's physical. It's objects inside of objects. So in this slide, what you see is a trend in hierarchy, and by the top, we've got four levels. The tiny little blue circles are nested within circles, which are nested within circles, which are nested within one big circle. I don't mean hierarchy in any of its other senses. I don't mean command hierarchies like an army chain of command. Captains are not physically nested within colonels. Corporals are not physically nested within sergeants. It would be an ugly situation if they were. So that's an utterly different kind of hierarchy. Am I talking about the major transitions? Um, it's been said that most scientists would rather use another scientist's toothbrush than his terminology. Um, I don't want to use the phrase major transitions, and here's the reason. Um, this is Maynard Smith and Zothmari's wonderful list of major transitions in evolution, 
And some of them are transitions in nestedness. That first one in particular, individual replicating molecules getting together in compartments. That is clearly a transition in nestedness. So is number four, a prokaryotic cell giving rise to eukaryotic cell. Historically, that's what happened. Eukaryotic cell is a nested set of prokaryotic cells. Um, <clears throat> number six is nestedness, eukaryotic cells to multicellular individuals. Number seven is nestedness. Um, clearly, I don't know about number five. I'm not even sure about number three. Um, I'm really worried about number eight because there doesn't seem to me, although I'll talk more, more about it later on in, in the talk, um, doesn't seem to me that there's any higher level emerging with the emergence of human beings. Um, and actually, I've never been totally comfortable with this list of major transitions. There doesn't seem to me, and maybe I'm just blinkered in some way, it doesn't seem to me that there's any theoretical unity behind it. What is it that's increasing from top to bottom of this list? Major transitions aside, there has been a trend in nestedness, and here it is. Prokaryotic cell gave rise to eukaryotic cell, gave rise to multicellular individual, gave rise to colony, and every one of those is a raising of the level of insideness. And here it is in a graph showing change over time. Those are first occurrences in the fossil record. First solitary bacterium at around 3.6 billion years ago. Um, First uh, solitary uh, eukaryotic cell, it's actually filamentous, could be cenocytic. We're not really sure whether it's really a single cell or not. Gripania at around two billion years ago. Um, there are some Ediacaran-like disks in the fossil record, assuming those are animals of some kind or close animal relatives. I just picked out Nimbia as an early occurring one. Uh, whether it is or not, what sort of beasts these are, we're not really sure, but they are clearly multicellular. They are huge. They almost have to be multicellular. And then finally, the first colony, the first highly individuated colony, a Dianulites, a Bryozoan at 480 million years ago. And here it is without the names and with some probably way too small to see pictures uh, substituted. Instead, the idea is that you're supposed to be able to see, even in those four data points, um, a trend. Problem with, with this trend, it's only four data points. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if we had more? Wouldn't it be nice if we could um, <clears throat> have more confidence in the trend by increasing the sample size? So I tried to find a way to do that by developing a scale, um, a scale of increasing individuation of each level. So let me walk you through it. Over there on the left, you see a single solitary entity at level n minus 1. I'll just call it an entity. I don't have any particular biological level in mind. Those entities can get together, they can aggregate, they can stick together um, <coughs> and form the next level up. We're now, we've now moved from level N minus one to level N. We're at stage A of level N. It's a simple aggregate. They're all the same. Think of it as an alga of some kind. If that's a protist over there on the left, if that entity is a protist, then an aggregation is some kind of alga. Uh, the next step in the increasing individuation of level N is stage B, and what I've tried to show there is differentiation. We've now got two entity types, the dark ones and the light gray ones. And you could have three, you could have four, you could have five. It's the first occurrence of, of differentiation uh, that's being mapped there. So stage B in increasing individuation is the differentiation stage. And then finally, stage C, where those differentiated entities have now organized themselves spatially in some way. Uh, imagine Volvox, if we're at the cell, multi-cell boundary there, with two cell types, reproductive cells and non-reproductive cells. The non-reproductives form a shell around the outside, that flagellated shell that you probably rem remember from um, high school biology or from looking through a microscope at a, any drop of pond water. Um, <clears throat> it's at the tissue and organ level, essentially. That spatial organization constitutes <clears throat> tissues and organs, and that's level C. And again, the word I'm throwing on to, um, to label this transition from A to B to C is individuation. The increasing um, <clears throat> autonomy of that level, the increasing organismness of that level, it's all supposed to be the product of selection. The assumption here is that selection acting on an aggregation will cause differentiation and then tissues and organs. And then the next step up 
is a level of nestedness above that where we take a bunch of uh, level, level NC organisms and aggregate them um, to form level N plus one. So here's the whole scale, the whole for slug in a scale. Um, down there at the left, level 1C is a solitary bacterium. They can aggregate to form level 2A, which is an aggregate of bacteria. They can differentiate to form 2B, which is a differentiated aggregate. They can form tissues and organ-like structures. What sort of collection of bacteria has spatial organization to the prokaryotes that make it up? The eukaryotic cell. Level 2C is a, pro is a prokaryotic cell. Um, above that is 3A, simple aggregates of eukaryotic cells, then differentiated aggregates of eukaryotic cells, differentiated aggregates with tissues and organs, right? I said volvox, but we're at that level 2. We're also, we're level 3C also. We just have lots of cell types and lots of tissues and organs. Then the level of, above us, aggregate of multicellular individuals, that's the colony and so on. And the, and the uh, it doesn't end at level 4C. In principle, this scale goes on um, indefinitely. Uh, this is a completely unnecessary slide just showing you those levels mapped onto the y-axis um, of a time graph. And there it is with some organisms thrown onto it. And let me take the organisms off in order to point to two puzzles. There's actually a bunch of puzzles, but these are the two most I see is the most interesting puzzles associated with this graph. Let me throw in a third. It's monotonic. It increases, it's always increasing. It didn't have to be. There's no law that says those levels have to arise in order. You could, in principle, jump from level 1C, the prokaryotic cell, up to level 2C, without, which is the eukaryotic cell, without going through the intermediate stages. Hey, in fact, we did. Right? It didn't form by an aggregate of undifferentiated prokaryotic cells. Uh, but the first occurrences in the fo fossil record seem to show a monotonic trend in the maximum. It's a trend in the maximum. This is the most, or the hierarchically highest thing you see in the fossil record, and presumably the lower levels are filled in continuously the whole time. Puzzle one is monotonicity. Puzzle two is the slow rate at which hierarchy is climbing early on. It's painful. We start down here at level, well, solitary prokaryote, those fossils are a little ambiguous, so I started at 2A, um, <clears throat> undifferentiated aggregate. But the time it takes to get from 2A to 2B is on the order of a billion and a half years. Right, and it picks up a little bit after that, but it's still quite slow. I don't have a story to tell about that slowness. I, we can make them up um, and maybe even come up with some testable ones, though I haven't heard, it, heard of any yet. Third and final puzzle. The trend seems to have come to a screeching halt 480 million years ago. Um, <clears throat> Tyler and I can uh, agree to disagree on this, um, and <clears throat> I'll have a few words to say about his 13 level system in just a moment. But first I want to point out that if we took this acceleration literally, this curve would have an enormously steep slope at this point. And you might ask yourself, where is it going to intersect time zero? What level should we be at? This is sort of a fun exercise. I don't put a lot of stock in the actual shape of that curve. But if you fit something like a quadratic to it, it turns out it intersects um, at about, intersects this axis at about level 22. Why don't we have any level 22 organisms around today? What would those be? They would be colonies of colonies of colonies of colonies of colonies of colonies. I'm not counting, are you? No. Um, up to 22, right? Um, and we seem to be stuck at level four at the most. Well, if you like those Argentine ants as colonies of colonies, then we're at level five, at best level 5A, meaning they have colonies of colonies, but no division of labor among the colonies. It's not like one colony of these ants is geared to reproduction and another one geared to foraging or anything like that. They're all pretty much the same. They just don't fight with each other very much. And then there's the problem of people. Um, <clears throat> and I think Tyler makes a good case 
for there being uh, levels of organization, levels of insideness in people that go above the colony level. We, for example, have not only families and villages, but we have meta-villages and nations and the United Nations and so on. My problem with that um, is that the hierarchy starts to look pretty weak, look pretty thin when you get up to those upper levels. There's lots of cross-cutting relationships that break, tend to break down hierarchy. So I can be a member of this village and a member of that village. I can be in a, a club over here that extends over many villages. I can be part of a professional association that extends over many states, right? So every time one of these cross-unit, cross-entity associations forms, that's the breakdown of hierarchical structure. Problem number one. Problem number two, for me anyway, is that just impressionistically, our commitment to sociality looks pretty pathetic. And I'm trying to look at this from a social insect perspective. Um, <clears throat> You think your society is demanding, you should try to live in one of theirs. They are seriously social. They are, their colony level is seriously individuated by natural selection. We can be impressed with our own, which compared to other primates may be quite significant, but compared to the social insects, we really haven't done much. Okay. To remind you where we are, I'm just developing a notion of hierarchy. I'm talking about a trend in hierarchy and some puzzles that arise in connection with that. And now <clears throat> I want to change gears somewhat and talk about the consequences of hierarchy, in particular the structural consequences of hierarchy. I noticed some years ago, looking at micrographs of cells, that free-living cells like paramecium or amoeba um, have a lot more stuff inside of them, have a lot more parts, a lot more junk, it looks like, to undergraduates looking at electron micrographs of these things. It's complicated in there, in those beasts, compared to the cells of metazoans and the cells of plants some of which, like these blood cells, have no organelles at all. They look very stripped down uh, compared to free-living cells. And this stripping down, if it occurs, would make enormous sense because, after all, that paramecium has to do absolutely everything for itself. It's got to feed. It's got to defend itself. It's got to move. It's got to reproduce. The list of things it has to do to get by in a complex and hostile world is quite long. Blood cell lives in heaven, all right? Skin cells live in heaven. Everything is delivered to them. Food is delivered to them. They don't have to defend themselves. Reproduction of the whole organism is being taken care of elsewhere. Some of them don't even have to divide very much, all right? It's a cushy life. So you would expect, given the minimal demands being made on them, that they would be somewhat stripped down. Selection would favor the loss of parts in units that are living inside a highly individuated upper level. So here was my hypothesis that as free living cells, like the one over on the left, got together to make multicellular organisms, the number of parts within the cells was reduced. Important footnote here. Number of cell types went up. In this figure it goes up. Over on the left we have one cell type. Over on the right, we've got four. There's four colors there, each one corresponding to a unique cell type. Complexity in the sense of cell types went up. What went down was the number of parts within those cells. The number of little circles went down on average. I threw in one with, with more parts. Um, but on average, it goes down on account of this selective stripping down uh, favored for on account of its efficiency. So is it true? To test whether it's true, I needed to count parts in cells. Um, I've got a theoretical definition of parts based on connectedness, composition, and shape. I won't bore you with that now. Um, instead, I'll just throw some examples at you. Here's a, here's a cell. It's got a mitochondrion. It's got a nucleus. It's got a plasma membrane. It's got a pseudopod and intracellular junction. For example, those are all parts. And there is, in theory, um, as I just assured you, um, a way to uh, make that claim robust. 
Um, this, uh, I'm not going to go through, it's just the three different kinds of parts that I identified in cells. This is based on uh, theoretical and empirical work looking at them and trying to, trying to make theoretical sense out of what, I, what it is I observed um, in electron micrographs. And I'll skip that one too because it's just identifying which, kind, which parts in the cell are which kind of my parts. Okay. Um, I'm not looking at a microscope when I'm counting cell parts. I'm not looking through a microscope at cells. I'm looking at electron micrographs in published papers, mainly from the heyday of the electron microscope in the 50s and 60s. Some glorious pictures in those journal articles, the Journal of Microscopy in particular. Um, and looking at those electron micrographs, trying to count parts. Now, the problem is that not every corner of every cell is going to be photographed in any given journal article. Um, and the descriptions in the paper are not going to cover everything in the cell. In particular, they're going to leave out the stuff that everybody knows is in there, what I call the standard set of cell part types. So every cell, it's assumed by the people doing this work, has a plasma membrane and a nucleus and mitochondria and free ribosomes and so on, and they're not going to zoom their microscope in on that stuff. It's the interesting stuff that makes the cell more specialized that they are going to pay attention to. So for my purposes, I wanted, I wanted a complete count. I can't have it. What I did, can do is assume every one of these in the standard set is present unless there's positive information or some positive statement that it's absent, some clear statement that it's absent. So all my part counts are in addition to the standard set, over and above the standard set, which means the numbers are going to be quite small. Here's an example from the genus Pedinella. It's from a single journal article from 1969. Um, just listing part types that appeared in the pictures and were mentioned in the descriptions. Uh, yellow, brown, chromatophore, contractile vacuole, flagellum, and so on. There were a total of eight parts in addition to a bunch of them that you see listed here at the bottom from the standard set, the nucleus, mitochondria, food vacuoles. Those don't count. They don't add to my eight, my total for this cell. Um, is just eight. Um, this is a complicated table. I'm only going to bother you with, it, with a small part of it. The column on the left is for 30 animal cells. The column on the right is for 26 free-living protists. And then the part counts that I've circled, 2.77 and 5.54, are the averages for those samples of cells. Um, averages, again, all of them in, in addition to the standard set. So it's standard set plus 2.77 in animal cells, standard set plus 5.54 in protist cells. The protists have more parts. Land plants versus protists, the numbers are practical. Well, the numbers for protists are exactly the same. The numbers for, animals, uh, for land plant cells are pretty much the same, 2.44 parts in addition to the standard set on average. So again, the protists seem to have more part types. So what does this mean, this loss of parts? What do I want to make about this, make of it? Well, from the perspective of the whole, what this amounts to, as I sort of already said, is a streamlining. Selection favors the loss of parts, the loss of functions, if you want, so that the cells can efficiently specialize. It's waste cutting. But from the perspective of the cells themselves, what it amounts to is a loss of autonomy. They're not really organisms anymore. It's that blood cell, we call it a cell. Historically, it was historically, it was a protist of some kind, right? Some coanaflagellate like protist. But it's not one anymore. Structurally, it's a cell, but not functionally, it's not a cell. It's a machine. It's a reliable, very efficient machine in service to the whole cell. It has no reproductive future, no mission, no purpose beyond service to the whole. It's, member, it's a member, essentially, of the Borg. Resistance is futile. Arguably, the same pattern takes place at the subcellular level. Um, a mitochondrion is a former eubacterium, but now it's quite stripped down. It's got no autonomy, no freedom. Even the metaphors we attach to it, we call it the powerhouse of the cell, as if in recognition of its machineness. Same for at two levels up, at the colony level. Um, those social insects, those workers running around in the colony are former, historically, former free-living solitary individual insects. And look at them now. 
there's been a loss of parts. In many species, there's an actual loss of ovaries, physical parts in the workers. But in all of them, there's a loss of behavioral repertoire, um, <clears throat> a loss of freedom. They're little machines, especially uh, the very small ones in the biggest colonies. Um, I'm tossing around a lot of language here. The, the only support I can draw for it at this moment, for the ants anyway, is a story I tell about a conversation once with Ed Wilson in his lab, chatting about this and that having to do with complexity in ant colonies. I'm watching him as he's talking, and he's reaching over and putting his finger on the ants running around on his desk and squashing them. I expected him to feel more affectionately toward these beasts that he studied his whole life. And I think towards colonies, and when he talks and thinks about the evolution of colonies, he does feel that way. But the little insects, and I asked him about this, he says, they're just little machines. And he put them out of their misery with no compassion or compunction whatsoever. OK. What have I done so far? Um, this, this was part two. I've identified a complexity drain and a loss of freedom. As multicellularity emerges, cells lose parts, autonomy, freedom. Um, I think this happens at other levels, too. There's a machinification, I love making up words like that, of mitochondria and of ants. Part three, teleology, goal-directedness, purpose. And I seem to be changing subjects radically. What could teleology possibly have to do with hierarchy? I'm going to argue here. It has everything to do with hierarchy, that teleology, goal-directedness, and purpose absolutely requires hierarchy. And here's the part where I stop knowing what I'm talking about. Teleology is the signature problem of biology, going back to Aristotle. And Darwin solved it. At least that's what we all tell each other over beers when we're talking, when this subject comes up, and it does from time to time. Darwin solved the problem of goal directedness, solved the problem of purpose, of, of adaptation in biology, which is a kind of purpose. He solved the problem of where it came from mechanistically. He didn't solve the problem of how it works. We still don't know how teleology works. We don't know the mechanisms that make, that, that make things appear to be goal-directed. I'm proposing that the answer has to do with hierarchy. And let me explain it with a little story. A peanut butter sandwich, that's a peanut butter sandwich, falls into a pond. and. It, Inside the peanut butter is this amino acid aspartate, which leaches out into the water and diffuses down current. And that's what those red dashed lines are supposed to show, is the diffusion of aspartate. In the upper left, you see a bacterium that finds itself inside this aspartate gradient, and it starts to swim. It's got a really cool mechanism for how it does it that I won't go into. But it follows this erratic trajectory that's roughly, on average, sort of kind of up the gradient. Notice a couple things here. The bacterium is revealing what the philosopher Ernest Nagel called the two key properties of teleological systems, persistence and plasticity. And he meant something very special by both terms. Persistence is returning to the same trajectory after error, after deviation. So the bacterium is deviating all the time. In fact, deviation is built into the propulsion mechanism, which involves a combination of straight runs and random walks. The straight runs increase as it nears the higher concentrations. The straight runs decrease, and the random tumbles increase as it, when concentration drops. So it's, all, it's zigzagging all over the place. My line that I've drawn there doesn't do justice to it. It's making errors all over the place, but it's persistent. Every time it makes an error and the concentration drops, it changes its strategy and does something else. Am I in high concentration or low concentration? I'm in high. I'll keep doing the same thing. Oh, now I'm in low. I'll do something else. Right? That's persistence, returning to the same trajectory after deviating, after making an error. Second thing, second um, signature of teleological behavior is plasticity. Following roughly the same trajectory from alternative starting points. That bacterium could enter the picture anywhere in those dotted red lines, anywhere in the food field, uh, and follow a similar trajectory up gradient. So that was the first thing to notice. It's got persistence and plasticity. That's why it looks teleological. 
It's on account of those two features of its behavior. Second, the bacterium, I want you to see it as, if you don't already, a little thing inside a big thing. The bacterium is the little thing. The food field, the gradient, is the big thing that it is immersed in, that it is part of, that it's inside of. So it's a hierarchical relationship that it's got there. And I'm about to try to convince you that it's the architecture, the hierarchical architecture, that makes persistence and plasticity possible. So the architecture of teleology requires three things, I argue. First, it requires upper direction. The lower level thing, the contained thing, needs to be taking its orders from something bigger than itself in some phase space. The upper level system acts causally on the contained lower level entity directing it on average. The bacterium is within the food field. What entitles it? What allows it to make errors, to deviate, and then to return to a trajectory? It's the fact that the food field is everywhere. It's big. No matter where the bacterium goes, it's still in the food field. The same causal structure, the same food field is acting on it right? no matter where it goes. Almost no matter where it goes. If it leaves the food field, then it stopped it stops acting teleological. It stops acting persistently. And the same with plasticity. It's on account of the food field being large and the bacterium being within it that you can place the bacterium anywhere within the food field um, and it'll follow a similar trajectory. Uh, requirement number two is partial freedom of the contained lower level entity, uh, which is also necessary for that persistent behavior. Remember, persistence is deviation, error making, and then return to a trajectory. If you don't make any errors, then you can't persist. You can't even appear to be teleological. Third requirement is the relative stability of the upper level, level system. That food field had better be fairly stable. If it's if there are water currents that are making it change all over the place, the bacterium is not going to follow a consistent trajectory. It's not going to appear to be goal-directed. This may strike you as a somewhat bizarre view. The food field as causal, I think we don't have any choice but to look at it that way because the alternatives don't seem to work. Let me try out two non-hierarchical alternative under, alternative understandings um, <clears throat> of that teleological system. We could look at the sandwich as causal. The sandwich is causing the bacterium to do what it does. Problem with that is the sandwich is in the future. My whole des description didn't involve a sandwich, it involved a food field. The sandwich is the source of the food field, but the bacterium doesn't have to ever get there, doesn't ever have to reach its goal in order to be goal-directed. So the sandwich is in the future, and we can't have the future causing the past. That isn't going to work. A more standard non-hierarchical view might be to see the internal mechanisms of the bacterium as causal on account of this very fancy and intricate signal transduction mechanism within the bacterium. It is able to follow the food field. Problem with that is it's causally insufficient. If I take a bacterium with a signal transduction mechanism and drop it in the water where there's no food field, it's not going to behave teleologically. It's not enough to have that mechanism. You need to have the upper level structure as well. So the hierarchical view that I'm pushing is um, a bacterium with some appropriate internal mechanism moves within a higher level system, in this case the food gradient, which contains it and directs it from above. And I think that's causally complete. A um, Couple more examples, um, a homing torpedo launched from that submarine at a target ship over there. It's a big thing within a little thing, which didn't come out on the slide. There was supposed to be a sound field. Oh, gosh, OK. Imagine a sound field emanating from the target ship. That's the big thing that tor the torpedo is immersed within and that accounts for the persistence and plasticity of the torpedo. If a passing pod of whales making some kind of noise deflects this torpedo off in this direction, direction temporarily, and now the pod of whales is gone, torpedo looks around, so to speak, where am I? Ah, the sound field, it's still there. Why is it still there? Because it's big, right? Because it's a hierarchical system with the little thing able to move around quite a bit within the big thing and not change its relationship to it that much. 
And of course, the sound field has to be stable and the torpedo needs to have some freedom of movement. It needs to be able to make errors. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> more teleology. In organismal development, this is um, supposed to represent the development of a sea urchin embryo. Those, look at panel A first. Those cells down at the bottom are going to migrate up to the equator, as they've done here, and then develop into the larval skeleton in this sea urchin. Turns out if you extract those cells experimentally and move them to the North Pole, they still, in panel B here, they migrate down to the equator. You can put them anywhere within that embryo and they'll migrate to the equator. Why? Because there's this field, and we don't know whether it's a biochemical gradient or a gene activation field, but there's a field of some, some kind, a global field, which those cells find themselves within. And it's the finding yourself within that enables them to persistently and plastically move to this target location regardless of where they start from. And I don't have the time to tell you about buffalo herds. Trust me, they're goal-directed. Okay. Important point. Hierarchy doesn't mean teleology. You can have a hierarchical system that's not teleological. Let me show you two ways in which teleology can fail. One of them is too much upper direction. That icon on the left is supposed to be a ball rolling downhill through a tube of some kind. There's no freedom there. The upper level system, the hierarchical thing above it is too confining, too constraining. Um, every run will be like every other one. There will be no persistence. Same with the boot up of a laptop computer, you've seen it, every run is the same, assuming your system isn't broken, right? The lower level system, the flip flops within the chip are highly constrained by the upper level software. Not enough freedom. And then um, <clears throat> in human social systems, daily life in any authoritarian social order, there's no latitude for individual um, decision making, for individual goal directedness or seeking. Um, that's true not just of authoritarian government uh, regimes of the left or the right, uh, but any small town, really. There's just too much upper-level direction. The alternative, not enough upper-level dire direction, will also mean a failure of teleology. And what, I'm, what I attempted to show there is a bison alone in a field, lost from the herd, no constraints, but no direction either. Or a torpedo launched by, mis by mistake far out at sea, no target ship, no sound field, wandering the ocean until the battery dies. And then in people, imagine a person in existential crisis. He might be well fed and clothed, he might even have friends, but he's seen through the social and political charades of our time and seen them to be phony and pointless. He finds himself feeling alone, without direction, without a cause, ironically detached no larger social project to direct him. He's a buffalo without a herd. He's a torpedo without a target. He's your average teenager. <laughs> so a, sum a summary slide. As new levels arise, and they do in evolution, not often, not easily, but they do arise, the contained organisms within them become upper directed. And as the individuation of that upper level system proceeds, as selection acts on the upper level system and individuates it, those contained organisms will tend to lose parts and tend to lose autonomy. They're transformed into machines in service to the whole. Teleology, goal directedness, purpose, and where we see it in biology is going to be at that sweet spot in the middle where individuation of the upper level hasn't proceeded very far at all hasn't proceeded too far, but has proceeded a little bit enough to provide some upper level direction. And I'll stop right there. Thank you.